1980, there was a horrific fire at the Eventide home, a home operated by the state for people in need. In that fire, only women died. The remains of over 150 women, old women, were interred in a single grave at Heroes Park. There is a monument there marking the spot. The half-hour radio documentary you are about to hear was done by me in 1985 as my final production as a student at the Caribbean Institute of Media and Communication, now the Caribbean School of Media and Communication, UWI, Mona, Jamaica. I am Faye Ellington. This is The Golden Years. Catamac Radio now presents The Golden Years, a reflection on the Eventide Home Fire of 1980 and how it affected the lives of a number of our senior citizens. It took me weeks to, to really come to myself. I couldn't eat in a flesh form. I've been seeing what fire can do to a human body. I'm used to, for example, dealing, handling parts of people whom I knew <laughs> in autopsies. But to this day, I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's something that will really never leave my, my mind. I have this picture uh, of, you know, unrecognizable corpses that are shrunk to half the size from the heat, you know, skulls being split open from the temperature. On the morning of May 20, 1980, the number of women in the Eventide home was drastically reduced. Myers Ward, which they occupied, had been completely destroyed by fire in just 10 minutes. 157 women perished. The news in the early hours of that day, and indeed for weeks, left many persons numb. However, 38 of the women who lived in Myers Ward escaped the Holocaust, among them, a blind woman, Lena Smith. Well, on the morning before the, about one o'clock, I went out, I get up, and I heard Collington Sinclair say one o'clock, and I was listening. I heard a patient say she saw the smoke. Once I saw the fire, I went and pitched the door open, and Jai Seatman was living nearby me. And I and she went outside. And after I came in back and hauled my grip and she take her box. And I put it down on the bench, but I saw little prayers. And the Lord said, don't go in back. And I took up my grip and put under my arm with my stick. And I shout out for fire. Lord of mercy, my sister, then burn up. And no one. And I was going down the step. I meet a worker and she rushed against my side and say, all that I worrying about, my money that burn upstairs. Well, I was shouting and go along. And when I go and reach the office, I never know where I was going. And Cherry Manga would say, come, Miss Simit, come up here. And I put my stick and touch the table. And I went and sit down on the table and the grip behind me and I say, thank you, Jesus. The fire was believed to have started shortly after 1 a.m. As soon as the fire call was received, Fire Chief Alan Ridgway set out with 50 men for the scene. The fire call was received at 1.20 a.m. on the morning of Tuesday the 20th. And um, as you're aware, the, um, the institution is only a quarter mile from the York Park Fire Brigade headquarters. The brigade reached there at 1.22 a.m. In all, there were a total of 50 members of the fire brigade who attended at this fire. 
On arrival there, a large building uh, with timber roof on which there was shingle was seen totally engulfed in flames. There was nobody running out of the building. Apparently, whatever the, um, the cause of the fire, it had um, spread rapidly through this old structure and um, encircled and trapped everyone that was inside. Because as I've said before, we didn't see anybody trying to escape from the building. And the fact of the matter is that the building was so totally engulfed in fire that nobody could, from the fire brigade could have gone in there. However, when we were coming in to the premises, there was a body lying in the driveway. We commenced firefighting with using three large jets to attack the fire. We heard no sounds, no cries for help, nothing at all. So at first we assumed that the building was empty. And shortly after, a worker from the institution came up in great agitation. This man didn't have on any shirt and he was panic stricken and he said, they are all dead, they are all dead. And when he was asked, who is dead? Is there people in the building? He said, yes, over 100 people, over 200 persons are in there and they are all dead. By then the entire place was burned flat and um, we could detect the odor of burnt human flesh, which has a significant odor. The old dilapidated building was made of pitch pine. It had long been in a state of disrepair and had been declared unfit for human occupation. Approximately 20 years before the fire in 1980, Myers Ward had been condemned. Myers Ward had been burnt flat with nothing left to indicate what might have started the fire. Director of the police forensic lab, Dr. Gladstone Taylor, had a difficult task. Well, I found a completely burnt structure uh, in the sense that for forensic analysis one, requi one requires more or less partly unburnt matter uh, before one can, you know, carry out the real practical and necessary tests. But in this particular case, the structure uh, apparently was of very old, ancient material, dried wood, really. That, um, and the fire was apparently so extensive that most of the material was consumed. So what we found really, <laughs> mostly charcoal. Um, we searched the place for things like cans, uh, containers, but everywhere, the thing was completely burnt down. Um, the pieces of evidence that we, we did examine um, proved inconclusive. I was dropping a little doors, and I hear one shout, fire! And as I get up, I take up my grip. I go to the front door, I couldn't come out through the smoke. I go to the back door, I couldn't come out, and I jump from upstairs. And when I jump from upstairs, I pan my grip, and I run to my side. And when I jump down, I get a bounce in my side, and I get it fracture. That was Alice Clark. Next, we'll hear from Isilda Powell, followed by Louise Stanley. Before I come out, you hear lots of crying, and you hear this, co this color, the people busting, bow, 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 yes. You just hear just bursting, bursting, bursting going on, and people bawling. A gateway, a climb a tree, a climb a tree. And the tree was nearby to the building, and I sipped down and drop on the ground. But the old building did fall, fall down the time. And, 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 and it go over the way. But I feel so irritable that I run down the dungle, down the bottom, and go sit down and cry. And them come for me. But you see all my higher way, wait. The fire propping on my eye, I can't hardly see now. The police forensic lab could not determine the cause of the fire. It had happened all too quickly. Those who visited the scene described it as horrifying. There were charred pieces of flesh that were once human beings. Charcoal remains of some of our older women, of some of our mothers. For days, many persons were unable to eat meat. Even the seasoned professionals were affected.
It took me weeks to, to really come to myself. I couldn't eat any flesh form. I've been seeing what fire can do to a human body. I'm used to, for example, dealing, handling parts of people whom I knew <laughs> in autopsies. But to this day, I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's something that will really never leave my, my mind. I have this picture uh, of, you know, unrecognizable corpses that are shrunk to half the size from the heat, you know, skulls being split open from the temperature. Here now are three of the other women who escaped. Speaking first is Clara Brown. Well, after I feel sad over it and everything, that's a good catch up with itself around one week's time. We know that we have to dead one day, all of us, but we didn't expect it so. Louisa Thompson. I was sleeping the night, fast asleep, and I dreamt that I go to Mr. Riney, East Queen Street Baptist, and telling him I trouble. And if you have time talking, you are talking, he said to me, say, when you go read the fourth Psalms, and I stop and we have a talk again, and we talk. And I said, Mr. Rainey, I don't remember the Psalms. He said, fourth Psalms. That's the second time. And then I talk, I talk, and the last word I said to him, I don't remember the Psalms, the fourth Psalms. And I heard fire. Hear me, Hear me when, when I, call, I call, O God, oh God of my righteousness. righteousness. Thou, hast Thou hast enlarged me when I was, I was in distress. distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. And I took up my pillow and I put one dress in it. And when I stepped out on the veranda, the upstairs veranda now started a blaze right over my head. And the heat took me and I find that I was in danger. And I heard the fire brigade coming back where you go and get a house. I said, I'm not going that way for these two fire brigade, one may pass and the other one hit me. And I turned down and the fire over the head, over the, on the veranda. Now the breeze of the fire start the thing up the clothes. I said, my God, if I am to die tonight, the flesh and the bone is for the fire. And my spirit and soul is yours. Doris Johnson. When the yellow light, I don't know what happened there. And I am way over the police station to save my life. And they may run and go, save my life. That time they leave the ward and hop in my stick and go out and fall down and get up and fall, pass out the dead house. In the eventide fire, only women died. The nation was plunged into mourning. Churches observed a day of prayer, and there was a memorial service at the Holy Trinity Cathedral. Many of those who died were forgotten by family and friends. The remains were dug up from the debris, packaged in plastic bags and taken away. Emergency units were put at the site to house the survivors, but some had to be taken away to be accommodated elsewhere. The Red Cross assisted as well. The fire victims were buried in Hewers Park. Thousands attended the funeral. The remains of over 150 women, old women, were placed into 26 wooden coffins and laid to rest in a single grave. That was 1980. There are numerous elderly persons who are classified as poor, indigent, or destitute. Very often, these are the persons who have no immediate family to care for them or to assist in the smallest way. These are the persons who are forced to look to the government for help with food, shelter, and clothing. Ms. Lena tells how she got to the Eventide home. I went there at 66, the 13th of December. First, I lose my sight, and I just think I hadn't known one. My husband died just recently, so the best way to take it, go via the government hall. I had no near family. It wasn't to my approval, but who has no way, I take it the best way. We how I was so proud. I never knew one like me would go to the evening tide, and wasn't nobody take me there. Me take myself for my family was nice to me. And I prepare, I make up my mind to go where the government have. And after when I got here, the condition wasn't so lovely. But I said, the Lord will take me out one day. The Eventide Home was established in 1870. It was located on Slipen Road in Kingston. 
The home was intended to house 160 inmates. The years passed, and by 1943, 968 inmates lived there. Until the night of May 19, 1980, there were 203 old women living in Myers Ward. In 1980, approximately 700 inmates lived at the home, including children who were physically and mentally disabled. But what have we done to improve the lot of our senior citizens since then? A general practitioner and psychiatrist, Dr. Agri Irons, expressed his views. Since that time, the, the society has focused a lot on the even tired home, due partly to a small nucleus of interested people. I think that people are to be congratulated for putting a greater focus on the elderly over the last five years. In tangible terms, you have the Golden Age home, which is a nicely laid out place. I, 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 I think it is very good. It has a great potential for creative use, gardens, smaller communities, family type setup and so on. At Bellevue, where a lot of people don't recognize, there are a lot of old people. In fact, most of our population, one third of it, is geriatric in nature. We have long recognized, but you know, more intensely over the last seven years, the need for creative cultural kinds of activity. Dr. Hickling, it was who started a rehabilitation program that involved putting work down in front of these people who were old for a long time and getting them just to move things around. And before you knew it, they were putting things together, making rugs, using their hands, smiling, their demeanor changed, etc singing songs, wanting to act in plays, etc. And there's a great focus on the elderly in psychiatry and as far as the Eventide Home. And I know as far as Professor Golding and his team of rehabilitation people are concerned, there is much more focus. The Golden Age project that was started in 1973 operates a number of clubs for the aged. These clubs try to address their cultural, spiritual, physical, social, and occupational needs. An organizer with the project is Mrs. Nellie Lawrence. Golden Age Project is really to provide the elderly population with some form of social enjoyment. Because you find that when people retire, they go home and they have, they have a lot of time on their hands and they want to spend it more gainfully instead of locking away themselves in the back room or so and think of their troubles. But we find in Jamaica that we have a serious class problem when it comes on to the Golden Age project. You find that people think that it belongs only to the poor people. But in all class, there is a certain degree of loneliness when it comes to retirement age. And that is why the government tries to bring in this age group into groups that they can um, provide themselves with little, with fun, enjoyment, whatever. The project is also responsible for organizing Senior Citizens Week in September each year. It provides a home help service where nurses, aides and volunteers visit the homes of the elderly who are in need. However, they are not involved in the government's home for the aged. People age at different rates. Very often, it is not the number of years that you have lived, but the toll the life you have lived has taken on your body. But as a society, who do we classify as being elderly? Depending on the society you're in, you can get different degrees of people being classified as elderly. Usually in Western civilizations, people classify those over the age of retirement or over the age of 65 as being elderly. With modern medical treatment and of course other types of lifestyles other than just going home from work and going back to work. More and more people are recognizing that people do not get elderly at a particular date in time. It's no longer a chronological situation, but a state of health. But for a rule of thumb, one would say that anybody who has passed the three score and 10, who is no longer 
gainfully employed who is in a dependent kind of situation would be classified as elderly. As a society, we have placed very little emphasis on preparing and providing for our golden ages. We should be attempting to change attitudes and behavior towards our senior citizens. Miss Lena believes that all persons who work with the elderly should be trained. If you don't get training, you can't do things to hold people. You can't love them. You can't bear with them because old people, they are very miserable. So you have to have some good training from your bird coming up to love your whole family. Then when you come up and to work with old people, you will have the same love. But if you don't get any training, like some of my girl in evening tide, they want to be trained. Groups and individuals did help from time to time at the Eventide Home for the Aged. A Catholic priest, Father Richard Holong, gave a lot of his love and time to the residents there. His work was greatly appreciated, and the love felt for him is strong. To tell you the truth, it was a rotten stuff, no secret. And since he came there, he made a lot of indifference. For some of the poor people them sick, he take them all to St. Joseph, that it nearly come against him, but he never mind. The Lord help him to pay the fee. And all when the rat of fear and all that, he get people to come in and volunteer. And from that, he been playing a part till he build faith home. Myself should go there, but through the bunk bed, I don't like it. Otherwise, I would be there. So he has do a big part. It was Father Richard Holong who made much of the indignities suffered by the residents known to the public. There was even a time at the home when rats shared accommodation with the people. The rats even used some human flesh to supplement their diet. No one will deny that it is sometimes difficult to deal with the elderly. But what should we expect? What are some of the things that old people experience? Despair sets in. Gloom is the picture of the future. And it starts to affect people's sleep and appetite, affect their conversation. They're very slow in speech, more slow than you know one would expect for their age. Old people need less sleep than young people, but you will find too that despite the fact that the normal older person sleeps less, they're, they're, they're going to have a sleep disturbance as well. They sleep even less than is normally expected for their age. They'll go after food, things are not tasting right. They start to complain and they start to do all sorts of, I won't say crazy things, but different things in order to get attention on the people around them, to get you to talk to them, to get you to notice them. Then there's the business of the fact that memory starts to fail. And you know how people are, especially in our culture. If you forget something, if you misplace something, if you can't remember where to find your things, then you think that somebody has stolen it, or somebody is interfering with your things, or somebody trying to trouble you. And of course, that sets on top of the depression a kind of paranoid mood. Why them don't go away and leave me alone sort of thing? Now, that is a definite thing with the elderly. And what usually happens is that people don't recognize that this is what people are going through, the old people are going through. And they react with annoyance which of course makes the situation worse. And you will often hear the depressed old person say, oh, I'm better off dead, I don't have no use, that sort of thing. One of the most common needs of old people is care. Not just being taken care of, but being cared about and being cared for. Good care and health is achieved only when there is a state of social, physical, and mental well-being. After the fire, a fund was started for the survivors by late-night announcer on RJR, Carlington Sinclair. The money and the interest amounted to half a million dollars. A committee was appointed by the government under the chairmanship of Mr. Sammy Henriquez to locate a site and construct a new home. The new Golden Age home is a statutory body. It is located on a 13-acre site at 3 St. Joseph's Avenue in Kingston 3. An officer with the Jamaica Defense Force with 29 years experience as an administrator is in charge. He is Major Desmond Clark. 
well, let's say after the fire, which destroyed a part of of the Eventide home, government saw it fit to sort of change the concept of the institutions that formerly housed the indigent of society, and they embarked on this project, but to take it out of the mainstream of government administration and hand it over to a board who I suppose they thought would be better able to deal with the situations that, that would occur, and hence the Golden Age Home Limited. On January 27, 1985, 63 residents were moved from the Eventide home to the new Golden Age home. They are now happy, relaxed, and contented. Some of those persons who often visited with them at Eventide have moved with them to the new home. One such group is comprised of a number of women from a Catholic church. One member of the group plays a guitar while the residents sing. Father, we thank you for your strength. Oh, yes. Father, we do thank you for this resident Amen. that we know nothing about. No. Only God provided. Yes. But no one have think of us. Yes. No one care for us. Yes. No one want us. Yes. But someone provide. Right. Richard Olam, yes. Sammy and Rickis, Major Clark, yes. Church and State, and others up to the school children. So, Father, let me give you thanks and praise for this resident, this consecrated spot. Father, we do thank you. So I've got to cry with you, Lord, and you weep for me. So, Father, let me give you all the praise and the honor and the glory. Thank you for these sisters. Three years gone, they've been visiting us, and they never leave us out. So, Father, we do thank you for them. We don't sit on us around, but we do thank you for them. Father, go with them. Walk with them, oh, yes. sleep with them, yes. house of prayer also. Oh, oh, Father, bless them now, Lord. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name we pray. The official opening ceremony of the Golden Age Home took place on Thursday, April 11, 1985. It was a bright, breezy, sunny afternoon. There were Jamaicans from every walk of life. Not an overwhelming crowd by any means, but an encouraging turnout. The Alpha Boys Band and the Jamaica Regiment Band provided musical entertainment. So did some of the residents themselves. Some pertinent comments were made by the Deputy Chairman of the Golden Age Home, Professor John Golding. Today, we have come to celebrate the first glimmerings of a national conscience, an example of the eternal responsibility that the more fortunate have towards the less, the debt the rich have to the poor. This Golden Age home is a concrete realization of these feelings by our citizens and our government. The official opening ceremony began shortly after 4 p.m. The media was well represented, radio, print, television. The lead stories on the electronic media that evening dealt with the increases in the price of flour and bread and focused on the disgruntled members of the Baker's Association. It is the poet H.S. Fritz who says, Age is a quality of the mind. If you take the best from life, if in life you keep the jest, if you hold on to love, no matter how the birthdays fly, you are not old. But if you leave your dreams behind, and if your ambition's fires are dead, then you are old.
Caramac Radio just presented The Golden Years. Your narrator was Alwyn Scott. Technical operator, Michael Chambers. We should like to thank all those persons who made this program possible. The Golden Years was produced by Faye Ellington for Caramac Radio.